Okay, open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 8 through 12. <clears throat> A few more verses. Peter's going to give us some instruction. Of course, we know that by now that the epistles, the little letters in the back of the New Testament are instructional epistles. They're instructing us on how to live the Christian life. Something interesting was brought up <clears throat> in our pastor's meeting this past Wednesday. <clears throat> it's just been on my heart. <clears throat> and I just want to share my heart with you right now. <clears throat> there was an observation that was made about generations and how people are saved. There is a generation that gets saved through the moving of the Spirit. You, you see the 1960s, 70s, the moving of the Spirit in, in the times of this youth rebellion in our society where all of a sudden the Spirit began to move and, and men were being saved in miraculous ways. I think of the Calvary Chapel movement. <clears throat> you know, Greg Laurie, Raul Reese. Raul Reese was ready to blow his, his brains out and his wife's just killer. And the Spirit moved uh, for him to watch TV, and, and Chuck was on there, and he gave his life to the Lord. I mean, that's a moving of the Spirit. Um, Macintosh uh, thought, I believe it was Macintosh, thought that his, his face was blown off because he was on drugs and so forth. And he'd walk around thinking half of his face was missing. And the Lord took a hold of his life through the Spirit. And then I was sharing about how God took a hold of my life. I mean, I didn't have someone preached to me. I didn't hear the salvation message. The Lord just began to move me to listen to Christian radio. And then Greg Laurie came on and it just changed my life. And the Spirit just took a hold of me and boom. I mean, I was like night and day, just boom. And the, ob the observation was made <clears throat> by somebody that the first generation is always a move of the Holy Spirit. The second generation is more a move of knowledge and understanding. It, it, it's, it's a move where the parents or those that were moved by the Spirit begin to instruct their children or those around them. And their salvation is brought about by their understanding Jesus Christ, that, that He <clears throat> came to die for their sins and that they're sinners and so forth. But the Spirit is not always there moving in a dramatic way where He is literally taking a hold of somebody. Where it's more of an individual taking a hold of somebody and directing them to the truth. And they get saved. And there's no difference in that salvation. I make that clear. They're both saved. But there's a difference in that conversion. A big difference. <clears throat> and I say this because <clears throat> as a pastor, and I'm having a heart <clears throat> for people to really know the Lord has to be a move of spirit in your heart. It really does. To where all you can do is think about Jesus. All you can do is want more of Jesus. All, everything that he has that you will spend hours praying and seeking him because you know there's so much of him to have and so much he wants to do in your life. And there's a big difference between that and, and knowing and acknowledging that yeah, I'm saved, but then going on with life. And not really desiring Him. Not really desiring to live rightly. See, a believer <clears throat> that knows the Lord desires to live for the Lord. And it's scary for me because I do see people, and I'm not pointing any fingers to anyone here, so don't, don't pastor's talking about me. <laughs> uh, the Spirit might be talking to you. I get worried. I get concerned. Because if you don't have the Lord rightly in your heart, you're not going to heaven. You're deceived, and He's lying to you. You need the Holy Spirit, and you need Him to work in your life actively on a daily basis. And it hurts to see people come in so excited, and then, boom, they fall away so easy. Because you know that it wasn't a true conversion. You know that they weren't sincere. There might have been other reasons or emotions and so forth. And, and those things affect you as somebody that's trying to reach to people and get a hold of their souls for God. You know, it does affect you. 
because you have a heart for it. And Peter here is having that heart for the people and encouraging them during time of persecution and suffering. They are going through a lot at this time, through their culture, the Roman Empire, the persecution. And it's very easy to lose sight of your objective, the cross, and how we are to live as believers when you are being persecuted. It's, it's hard for us if someone is always criticizing you to love them. It's hard for us when you're a caregiver. You know what a caregiver is, right? Somebody who takes care of other people. And that's a certain gift and personality. There are people that just love taking care of people. And, and they're always taking care of people, always taking care of them, helping them out, giving them money, taking care of their needs. And then one day they have a need. And they reach out and say, could you help me? Oh, I don't have time for you. Right? Oh. You know how devastating that is? To always give, 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 and then all of a sudden you need help, and then no one wants to help you. That's hard. And see, Peter's talking to people like that. They're living during times of persecution and suffering. And they don't want to give because they're tired. They don't want to love because it's a struggle because no one's loving them because they're being persecuted. Their families are being taken away and so forth. And Peter is encouraging them here through the Spirit of God, you must continue to keep your focus on the objective. And that is Christ. That He is the one we serve. He is the one that we're to please. He is the one that is our God and our Savior. And it's through Him and with Him and of Him that we will succeed. And we have to keep that in mind. We need a fresh awakening of the Spirit. Our church, the church is dead, guys. The church is dead. It is dead out there. There are not churches out there filled with the Spirit of God. Even the Pentecostal churches are dying out. The Assemblies of God, which was a great movement of God back in the 70s and 80s, is also dying out slowly. And what we need is God to move within the church again, afresh and anew. But He's looking for our hearts. He's looking for that desire. And that's what Peter's looking for, to stir up in the hearts of these believers. As you know, we've been talking about submission. Submit to your government. Submit to your employers. Submit to your husbands. And husbands, you are to understand your wives. And I noticed that husbands weren't here last week when I taught on that. A lot of them just skipped out. I'm like, what? What's going on here? Why did they skip out? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach that message again for you husbands who skipped out. No, I'm kidding. I'm there were a couple of guys who came in here and they heard the theme and they just got up and walked out. And they told one of the ushers, um, we're not filling this message today. And they walked out. <laughs> See, that, that's what troubles you, you. Things like that. I'm not feeling that message. That's God's word. Be careful when, when you read God's word and you say, I don't believe that. Oh boy, something else is wrong. If you don't believe that. Because this is God's word from Genesis to Revelation. Every word, every dot, every line is God's word and it's important for us. Whether we believe it or not, we should at least accept it. And so he talked about husbands and how they ought to treat their wives and if they're not treating their wives correctly using the principles of God, then their prayers are hindered, right? God won't hear them or he'll put their prayers aside until they get right with their wives, they continue on. So in that context, Peter continues and he gives some practical instructions to all Christians, including husbands and wives and, and employees and those that are to submit to government, which is all of us. And so he says in verse 8, finally. The word finally is not saying I'm done. I'm finally over, you know, like a pastor who says, finally I'm, I'm getting into the clothes and then he goes on for another hour. You know, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, finally, I'm taking the point that I've been making on submission and I'm bringing it to an understanding. Kind of taking it all together and this is, this is my main point. And so he's giving us his main point. And the next statement is that all of us, all of you, be of one mind. Be of one mind. In other words, he's calling us to unity. Now, how the church is so ununified, 
It is amazing. It's crazy out there. And it brings about confusion, doesn't it, to the world. Because one church says this and another church says that. And it's hard to understand what truth is. What am I to believe in? How am I to trust that person when he says this and he says that? How do we find truth? We find it in the Word of God. And really, we have to do our homework by reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God in order to bring about this one mindness, this unity within the body of Christ. It's possible because the Scripture calls for us to be of one mind, right? God wouldn't ask us to do something that was impossible. So he's saying, be of one mind, so it's possible. And you know, one day we will be of one mind. Guess when that day is? When we're in heaven, right? And we'll know, as John says, we know all things as Christ knows all things. And so we won't be divided over evolution or creationism, Calvinism or Arminianism, or whether we're to baptize fully submerging or whether we sprinkle water on someone. You know, all these things that divide us, you know, will finally be revealed in heaven. Well, God has revealed them on earth, And it's our responsibility to get into the Word of God and find out what is true. And then be like-minded in those areas. Oh yeah, there's always those gray areas. I understand that because of our lack of Greek and and looking at it in context and so forth. But if we take the time, I believe we'll find some like-mindedness in here. And most of us are willing to have one mind, aren't we? I think we are. I think we want one-mindedness and unity, which brings about peace. The problem is that we long that that mind be my mind and not your mind. Yeah, we can be one-minded as long as it's my mind and not yours. That's not what Peter is saying. In fact, Peter is not even saying, you know, my mind. Peter is saying Christ's mind. We are to be like-minded like Christ is. And so we're to have the mind of Christ. Can you imagine what would happen in the church if we were like-minded? Imagine how powerful it would be. Imagine our government changing, going back to the foundations of Christianity, what it was birthed upon. I mean, it would be an awesome thing if we were like-minded. Because there are some churches that say, no, we don't get into politics. No, no, stay out of politics. We're spiritual, not political. And then there are churches that say, yeah, we need to get into politics. Our forefathers who were Christians were in politics. They started this great nation, and we're divided on that. And if we get back to what God has said, that even governments are subjected to Him. Him. Imagine our world, what it would be like. I mean, that's why we have hospitals, right? Because there was a Christian man or a woman, and I don't know who who in the very beginning started it, but it was... Christianity that started hospitals because these men cared like Christ for people. Said we need to build a building where we can take care of people. And the, and the hospitals were birth. It wasn't the atheists or the agnostics. It was Christians. Convalescents, older people. No one takes care of them. It was the Christians that said, let's, let's have a place where older people are taken care of. That's like-minded, like Christ and so forth. I find it interesting that, that we are so divided on so many areas because we're not reading the scriptures within its context and the way that it's being presented from the gospel's perspective, from God's perspective. We just saw the debate last Tuesday. Those of you that were here, it was a great debate. How many saw the, the debate? How many saw it this twice? A few, I saw it several times. You know, the more I see it, the more I realize that Ken Ham did a great job. Great job. And now the commentaries are getting out, the transcripts are written, and every line is broken up, you know, and people are now commenting on it, and other, other apologetics are, are looking at it and so forth. And boy, Bill Nye, the science guy, a uh, smart guy, <laughs> got in, himself into some trouble there. But I found it interesting because immediately afterwards, Pat Robinson, how many know who Pat Robinson is? He has a ministry called the 700 Club which is on TV. It's a Christian radio broadcast, television broadcast station. Uh, I mean, I used to watch him all the time. I don't watch him so much now, but I used to watch him all the time. He had great guests on there and a great time of prayer, asking for healings and things like this. But he stands up and he starts talking about evolution and creationism. And do you know what he said? 
that these people, these Christians that are teaching creationism, they're making us look stupid. He says, because it's not true. Evolution is true. Scientifically, and he goes down, scientifically it's been proven, and I'm just like, what? You are bringing confusion to the body of Christ. And Bill Nye, the science guy, he did say that, right? Isn't it interesting, Bill Ham? That only a few of you believe in creationism, and a lot of you believe in evolution. That doesn't make it right. Didn't Jesus say that few will enter into heaven, and broad is the way to destruction? Right? Didn't Jesus say there's only a remnant within the church? A remnant means a small amount of people. Even within the church right now, I mean, I'm looking at you, I love you all, but there's some of you that aren't going to make it because you know your secret sins. You know if you really believe or not, and God knows your heart. There's always a remnant. It's always a small amount. I'd rather look at the small amount. The one that's fighting the most, struggling the most, are probably the ones that are right, more than likely. A remnant. And yet we're divided. So how do we bring about this unity, this one minus? Listen to what Paul said to the Philippians. Philippians 1.27 Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. So I may hear, you know, what you're doing. What's going on in your life? How are you in the ministry? How's it going in the ministry? What's the ups and downs and so forth? That you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul's command to them was that they be of one spirit, one mind, of faith. So we are to be like-minded when it comes to scriptures and what God has said to be truth. Because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am truth. Jesus is truth. And there's no other way to the Father except through Jesus. And so we're to be like-minded. How? Through the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, I believe, he says that he's called pastors, teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that we become one in fellowship. The oneness, the unity. Peter quotes Psalms 34. Psalms 133 talks about the unity of the brethren together. Old Testament. So God's heart is that we are like-minded, that we become one in spirit. He goes on and says, fulfill my joy, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So this like-minded is that we love one another, in spite of one another, in spite of our differences, in spite of our age in Christianity. You might be a babe in Christ and you're growing. We understand that. Or you might be an adult in Christ and you're acting like a babe, but we understand that that happens once in a while. But grow up, mature. And Paul goes on and says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Because that doesn't bring about like-mindedness, right? When we begin to do things for our own benefit. For our own benefit. And these are things that we're looking out for ourselves. And so we're looking for opportunities to grow in the church. To move up in the church because we have an ulterior motive. And that can't be. We have to fulfill God's calling. But he says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now that brings upon like-mindedness, right? Spirit of unity when we think of others more highly than we think of ourselves. Because that keeps the peace. So he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So the mind of Christ. The unity of Christ. How important is one-mindedness? It's very important to the church, to the function of the body of Christ. If not, we are divided, right? Right? And we can't stand. And Jesus said, a house divided, what? Cannot stand. And so we have to be like-mindedness. But what about the differences? What about those differences? What about water baptism fully emerged and sprinkle some water on the baby? Now what about that? Read the scriptures. You will not find one place where you sprinkle water on a baby. But you'll find plenty of places people are immersed in water. So just fall on the scriptures. We're to submerge in baptism. <clears throat> what about Calvinism? God chooses. Yes, he does. But we also have a free will to choose him. How does that work? I have no idea. Don't ask me. But it's both. I have a free will to choose God, but somehow he chose me to choose him. It just works that way. I don't understand it, but it's just the way that it works. So both are true to a certain degree. 
So we find those commonalities and be like-minded. And it comes really in the Scripture. Not my mind. Not what I think is true. What does the Scriptures think is true? What about the churches divided on the different denominations, non-denominational, you know, and so forth? And Calvary Chapel, now they're, they're, they're saying, you know, Chuck is gone, the church is going to split. Calvary Chapel, now you're going to have free Calvary Chapel, you know, or, or, or the, you know, I don't know, some name for Calvary Chapel, you know, because it's a split off of Calvary Chapel and so forth. Because there are people within Calvary Chapel that aren't like-minded. This church is a Calvary Chapel founded on Pastor Chuck Smith's principles that he has pulled out of Scripture. And as long as I'm here, that's how this church will be run because it works. It works, and I believe it's biblical. There is another model for a church, and it's what they call the elders model, where you have many elders running the whole church. It's not just one man. And you have a pastor who's a senior pastor, but you also have other pastors that are teaching pastors, and they're all submitted to one another and they run the church together. That's another model. Our model is the Moses model. God called Moses to be the head of Israel. And so Chuck has taken that and says God has called the pastor to a certain community. It's a calling. It's not a career. It's a calling. And he calls you there to stick it out there and to fulfill his calling. When I started this church, I wanted to be a Calvary Chapel. And at the time, they said, no, you can't be one because you're too close to another one. But they asked me to go to Norco. They said, you can go to Norco and, and we'll start you in the process and you can be a Calvary Chapel Norco. And I said, but I'm not called to Norco. And Chuck has always taught that you go where God's calling you. It's not a career. It's not a choice. And so I stayed here in Mariloma where I felt called whether the church was big or, or small or medium, and it has its ups and downs like any other church does. I stayed here because that's where I'm called. And then God said, hey, because of your faithfulness, I'm going to make you into Calvary Chapel. I didn't even ask. They came to me and said, why don't you come to one of our luncheons? And I went. Then they said, why don't you become a Calvary Chapel? And I said, like, it's taking you long enough to ask me. <laughs> but sure, I will. What do I need to do? And I went through the process and I did. Can I use the name? No, you can't use the name. And I said, oh, okay. Yeah, but wait a year, then you can use the name. And it's like, God just takes care of everything. Waited a year, the day of the year, I said, can I use the name? Yeah, just clear it from this guy. And then I went to the guy, and the guy goes, I don't want you to use the name. I'm like, okay, but if God's telling you to use the name, use the name. <laughs> I go, well, he's telling me, so I'm using it. And we did. See, God takes care of it when we follow his principles. This is a Calvary Chapel, and it's going to be a Calvary Chapel. Whether anyone likes it or not. And I have people that don't like the philosophy. I have had people say, you need to ask for more money. You have to teach a special message on tithing. You know, I'm like, when it comes up in scripture, I'll talk about it. And plus, we ask every morning when we pray for it, but we don't get in depth, you know. And I said, that's not Calvary Chapel's way. We let God do that. God will touch a person's heart, and then they'll give because they love the Lord. And it'll happen that way naturally. And God has been faithful to do that for many years. I don't go out of my way and say, oh, you know what? The Lord laid on my heart to talk about tithing today. And then next week, you know what? The Lord laid on my heart to talk about offerings today. And then next week, oh, the Lord laid on my heart to talk about wave offerings. And it's like there's a lot of offerings there the Lord can lay on your heart. You know, that's not the way. We teach through the Bible. We're going to continue to teach through the Bible so that we don't find, so that we don't find ourselves in errors. Being simple. How do we get like minded? And so we need to be in Scripture. We need to study it in its context, you know, in the Greek and so forth as much as we can, and then come to a unity in that like mindedness. And he, that's what he's calling for. But he's also calling for like mindedness in our love for one another. So, so notice what he says in the next statements. So I'm going to go through them quickly. So, being like minded, having what? Compassion for one another. The word compassion is a two Greek words, and it means to be affected. But it also means with. You're affected with. Compassion means that you feel for the person. It's, it's where we get our word sympathy. When I was young, I didn't really feel for older people and their infirmities. You know, when I was 33, old guy would come to me, my back is killing me. Could you pray for me? Sure, brother. You know, and I'm 33. Let me pray for you. Father, just heal this man because he's in some pain. Lord, thank you in Jesus' name. I walk away and never think about it. Now someone comes to me having all this pain. Someone says, could you pray for me? Because my back, I'm like, 
Oh, man, yeah, I, I know how you feel. Oh, boy, because I know it goes right down your back, down to your side, sciatica, down to your foot, and your foot feels, I know exactly, yes, come over here. Father, please, Lord, please, because I know how this feels. Please, tell you. Big difference. Big difference. You know, but you're young, you're cocky, you don't know whether you're going to live forever, and God knocks you down. You know, we need to have compassion, sympathy for one another. Love as brothers, love as brothers. This, this word is not a spirit-filled love, agape, unconditional. This is more a brotherly love. And that we're to just love one another as human beings. Just have this common love for one another. Uh, be tender-hearted. Be tender-hearted. The word is translated full of pity. Full of pity. We're to pity others. This scripture has helped me out a lot when I view other people that don't understand you have a certain pity for them because they don't understand. They're not there yet. They haven't matured or they have no understanding of the scriptures. It helps me to deal with unbelievers. Sometimes unbelievers can be cruel and mean. They say some bad things about you, you know, and do bad things. And it's very easy to get angry and mad at them and want to retaliate. But then when you realize that they don't know what they're talking about, they're just naive to truth. They don't have God in their heart. They're deceived by the devil and they're going to hell. You can have pity on them. You're like, oh, poor, poor boy. You know, they could be screaming and yelling at you. You're an unloving, caring person. And you're like, poor boy. God, he's going to hell. He thinks like that. I feel sorry for you. You think that way. It helps you deal with it so that you don't get angry and frustrated over it. And have pity on others. Because they don't know. Be courteous. There's one that we... We need to do more of. Be courteous, guys. You know, you go to the grocery store, a lady's coming out of the store, and you watch her open the door and get out. Say, no, open the door for her. <laughs> you know, that's courteous. The word means to be humble in spirit. You're humbling yourself. Say, oh, I'll, I'll be your doorman. Let me open that for you. It's amazing when you do stuff like that, that people actually, oh, thank you. And they're surprised that you would even do something like that. You know, do something like that. Someone drops something, pick it up for them. We've gotten away from that, our society has, and being just courteous to one another. We're, we're easily to cut in line, you know, and be uncourteous. Well, there's my friends. Let me cut in line there. You know, Thanks for saving me the spot. <laughs> you know, that's not courteous. That's rude. Peter tells us in 5.5, 5, we'll get to it later on, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Be courteous towards one another is what he's saying. Then he says in verse 9, not returning evil for evil. In other words, uh, don't get back. Don't get even. In fact, the word implies a debt. A debt. You know what a debt is, right? A person owes you something. Sometimes when you get hurt, you think of it as a debt. Oh, you hurt me. I owe you. I owe you. That's the Greek. It's suggesting that you're looking for an opportunity to pay that debt off. And so you're looking for an opportunity to be evil to that person. You know, well, next time I see you and something's happening, I'm just going, ah, <laughs> there, see, God got you. <laughs> That's for being evil. The word evil here means a lack of something. What is a lack of? Good. It's a lack of good. So what Peter is saying is don't lack good, but have good towards others. Don't get even. Let God take care of it. And he always does. The flesh wants to get even. It's, it, it, it flesh is just there, right? You know what I mean? You all know what I mean. You're, you ever see a little kid that doesn't get their way? They get even. How? By screaming and yelling. Right in the middle of the store where everybody's watching you and you're going, I'm going to kill this little kid. Yeah, and he's looking like, ah, I got you, Mom. Everybody's looking at you and I'm getting even at you. you know? Kids do that. They get even. They get even with you. Those are little kids. Adults do the same thing. Just hurt an adult. And they're like, you just wait. I'm going to get even with you. Next time you need help. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm busy. I can't help you. I'd love to help you, but I can't. Sorry. Aha, I got him. I got him, you know. We do that as adults. Peter's saying, don't do that. We're not to do that. We're not to have the absence of good. You know, we... we have those personality, you, know, you ever have someone that's just a different personality than you? Just rubs you the wrong way, you know? It's hard to deal with that. My wife tells a story uh, when we were at the other Calvary. 
and there was this little Mexican girl, very talented with the guitar, sing very well, it's already did a couple of CDs and so forth. And she just came in and the pastor just really was drawn to her, raised her up and she's doing music for the women's music. And my wife says, you know, she's told the story. She goes, I had this thing, it's like something was there. It's like, oh, who's this person? Who does she think she is coming in here like this? And, you know, and so forth. And she was struggling with that. And so then she decided, I'm going to get to know them. So she went over, started talking, they became friends. They became friends, good close friends. And, she taught Virginia how to play the guitar and gave her a guitar and, you know, the whole thing like that. You just never know. You can't let the personalities get in the way. You need to allow goodness to come forth. He goes on and says, but on the contrary, blessings. There we go, blessings. Now, this word blessings doesn't mean you have to give them a gift or giving them something. It's saying talk good about them. Don't talk evil about them. Don't be on the phone. Did you know, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're getting even, is what you're doing, because you're letting everyone else know by gossiping. That's ungodly. That's not like-mindedness either. Nor is it of one mind. No, Peter's saying, bless them. The word "bless" there is the is the word where we get our word eulogy. You know, you go to a funeral and you have the eulogy, and you, usually the eulogy is where you talk bad about the guy that just died. No. You don't talk bad about him. You talk about the good things, the guy. He might be the worst person in the world, but you get up there and says, you know what, he always smelled great. At least that's a good thing. <laughs> we talk good about them, right? We talk about all the times, the memories and so forth. When my grandpa died, he was 99 years old. And he was an unreal guy. I remember going to my mom's house one day, and, and he had this cane that he had, kind of like little Harvey Hawk Jr., and he's always hitting it on the ground, getting the ants. Once in a while, when you get angry, he'd take the cane and he'd come after you with the cane like this. You know, he's in, in Spanish, I'm going to get you, hijo. You know, and just beat you up. You're like, God, Willito, stop it. And I remember uh, my, my parents were gone, and so I had to sleep, spend the night there, and I slept in my mom's room, and he was in the next room. I had nightmares. I, I was dreaming that he was on the door, banging it, open this door, I'm going to beat you up. And he had the cane in his hand. You know, this is the guy he was. But then when the funeral came along and, you know, everyone talked about how good he was, what a hard worker he was, you know, how loving and caring, you know, in his last days were, they, they eulogized him. They talked good about him. Was he good? Not all the time. He was honorary, especially in his last days. He got dementia. And everybody was with him. You're stealing my money. Lito, you don't have any money. Oh, I have boxes of money in my closet. They're like piled up. And you come in and you take it every night. Like, okay, sure. No, talk good. We don't talk about those things, except for behind the pulpit, as an example. <laughs> but we eulogized him. We talked good about him. The word blessings here is EU for good and logos for word. So good words. Say good words. Instead of invoking bad words about someone to someone else and gossiping and lying and trying to defame their character and slander them, because that's all negative and evil. It's an absence of good. And that speaks against that person, by the way. You ought to just eulogize them, speak good about them. They're good. They're hard workers. They're faithful. They love God. Just find those things and just speak on those things. Why? Knowing that you're called to this. Literally, into this you were called. This is what God wants of you is to be that type of person. Why? That you may inherit a blessing, same word, that others will eulogize you. If you talk good about others, then others will talk good about you. But if you talk bad about others, and gossiping, and spreading lies, and rumors, do you know what that person is saying in their head while you're telling them all this stuff? <laughs> They're wondering if you talk about them. They're wondering what you say once you're gone. But if you talk about good things and someone comes along and says, you know, so-and-so, no, so-and-so is great. I've never heard them say a bad thing. They're good people. You know, they care. They really do. And they start talking good about you. That's the principle that works here. But do the opposite and the opposite happens, right? So he goes on in verse 10. He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. I love this scripture. It's quoting from Psalms 34. 
from the Old Testament. He's bringing it into light here in the New Testament to the believers. And now I'm bringing it to you saying, if you love life, in other words, in the Greek, it's the idea that if you wish to have a long, prosperous life, then apply these things to your life. I love that because I've struggled with that. Why am I doing good? I want to do good because God is working in me. But also I want to do good because I want to live a peaceful life, a restful life, a good life. I want to be blessed. And God blesses you. He tells you that right here. If, if you want a good, blessful life, do these things and you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed by others. You'll be blessed by God. You'll be a blessing completely when you apply these things. This is a description of a Christian, right? This is a description of a Christian that wants to be used of the Lord. He says his lips and his lips from speaking deceit or trickery or entrapments, deception. Um, the Greek suggests a fish hook. You're entrapping someone by your words. You used to have a boss that would do that. He's waiting for an opportunity to trap you. Then he goes on and says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Now this is a good thing to do. Get rid of the evil thoughts. Get rid of the evil speaking. Get rid of the evil ways and pursue good. When I first got saved, one of my heart's desire was to be a godly man <clears throat> because I know that I was an ungodly man before I got saved. I was a terrible husband. I was a terrible father. All I cared about was me and no one else. I would tell my wife where we were going, what we were doing. I would tell her what she would wear. I told her what to do because I was the man. And we weren't going to do anything else but what I wanted to do. I governed my children with an iron fist. I controlled them. I told them to sit and don't move. And they didn't move. If we went somewhere and they moved, they got in big trouble. And kids would come up, can you go play? And they're like, no. Why not? And dad said, no. I was messed up. And so when Christ came into my life, and I started reading the scriptures, I'm like, Lord, I'm not this person. And I want to be this person. I want to love my wife the way you tell me I should love my wife. So I started reading books, Dobson, started listening to Dobson, focus on the family, started trying to figure out how I can love her more, be more compassionate. It took a long time, and God's still working on me. How do I raise my kids? Lord, I started reading Dr. Dobson, listening to fa focus on the family, listening to family life, getting other books, reading scriptures. How do I raise my kids so they're godly kids, so I train them up in the Lord? How do I do that, Lord? I, I want to know how to do that. Please help me. And he changed me completely. And he still changed me because now, you know, it's a whole new venture. I have adult kids. I've never had adult kids, so now I'm learning. How do you deal with adult kids? I never even thought you'd had to. You know, and then grandkids. And, you know, and she's a beautiful 14-year-old girl. And, boy, I'm like, put a lock and chain on her and let no one near her. You know, because I don't want great-grandchildren yet you know, until later on. And then how do you deal with great Great grandchildren. I am old. You know, all those things. But Lord, help me with all this. You know, it, it, it really takes a desire to want to be the godly man that God wants you to be or woman that God wants you to be. You have to have that desire, a desire of the Holy Spirit. The desire to turn away from evil and do good. I want to do good, Lord. I want to pursue peace. And when you do these things, you're blessed. And God blesses you. Notice the reason why we want to do these things also. Look at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord on the righteous. God sees everything. You can't hide from God. The psalmist said he tried to hide from God. He went, he went to the deepest of waters. Guess what? God was there. He went to the highest of mountains. God was there too. You just can't hide from God. You think you're hiding from God? It's amazing how people will, will do sin. They know it's sin and they know it's wrong, but they're looking around like, God, you don't see me now, do you? And they just do it. And God's just like, I see everything you do. God's eyes are on the righteous. That is, his eyes are on his children because he loves his children. And he watches them daily. And he looks at you through the eyes of Christ, that you are righteous because of his righteousness. 
And he loves you that way. Also, his ears are open to your prayers. He hears you. Now he's referring back to husbands, right? Look, husbands, if you don't live this way, guess what? I put your prayers aside until you get right. And then I hear your prayers. So Peter is saying, for all of us, if you don't live like this, I'm not hearing your prayers. Maybe that's why you're not being blessed. That's why God isn't answering you, because you're not living according to scriptures. You're gossiping, you're murmuring, you're complaining. You're not forgiving. You're not moving on. You're not growing. You're not allowing the Spirit to lead you. You have no, you know, and so God says, I don't hear your prayers. But He hears our prayers, and He hears a prayer of a heart that says, Lord, would you change me? change me, help me, Lord, to be that godly man and that godly woman. But the face of the Lord against those who what? Read that, guys. The face of the Lord is against who? Let's be one-minded here, against those that, are, that do evil. So if you do evil, if you do wrong, then God's face is against you. Now, it doesn't seem like it, huh? Because the world's getting away with a lot of evil. You're like, man, Lord, why aren't you coming against them? He will. He's having grace right now. But one day... They're going to see Jesus coming on a horse and judgment's coming with him. And he will judge them. But for us, remember, he chastises those whom he loves. And he loves us and he will chastise you face to face to let you know he loves you and that you're his child and he won't let you get away with anything. In Psalms 34, 16, it says, The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut them off from the memory of the face of the earth. And he will do that one day with all. Let's close these instructions. Doing good is one of the best ways of not doing evil. Be busy with God's work. Desire to do good and you won't do evil. It's kind of like that that thought. Stay so busy with God that you have no time for the enemy because you're so busy with the Lord. And also remember this, that Jesus said in John 13, 35, that everyone will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have one for another. Love one another. Be like-minded. Let me take a few minutes. I thought I was going to do it, but maybe not. If you don't know the Lord, I pray that you would seek Him out. And seek Him out in a powerful way. Asking Him to really change your life. As I said earlier on, not just a head knowledge and an understanding, which will bring about salvation, but a move of the Spirit. A move of the Spirit. See, in order for the Spirit to really move in your life, you have to recognize one thing. You are a sinner. You're wretched. You're no good. You deserve death. How can you say that? Because the Bible says it. There are none righteous. No, not one. When I got saved... Greg Laurie was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, if you, ever, if you ever lied, you've broken God's commandment. If you ever lusted for a woman, you've committed adultery. If you ever had hatred towards someone, you've committed murder. You know, when he said those words in my heart, I'm like, man, Reuben, you're guilty. You're going to hell. That was the first thing that I thought of. You're going to hell, and you deserve it. And at that moment, I realized I'm doomed. And there was no hope for me. I was in despair. Didn't know what to do. Didn't know where to look. And of course, you know Greg Laurie. Within a few minutes, he says, but there's hope. There's Jesus Christ. And I'm like, okay, so I really listen now because I'm talking. I'm going to hell, burn forever, you know, because I'm guilty and I've done all these things and worse. And you say there's still hope? Okay, what's that hope? Jesus Christ. He took your place. See, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Someone always pays for our sins. Always. Always. If you take up a handicapped parking spot and you're not supposed to, that's breaking the law. And the law requires judgment. Somebody's paying for that. Well, no, I got away with it. No one paid for it. Wait a minute. Some guy in a poor wheelchair came by and saw your car there. He had to go park somewhere else. And then he had to pull his chair out then open the door and try to get himself out of the little tiny spot. He was paying for it because you were selfish to park there. Sin always has a repercussion. You know, someone is paying for it. You're a, you're a gossiper. You're, you're talking to people. Someone's paying for it because now you're slandering someone's name and that person is thinking evil of them too. That person's suffering. 
Their name's been defamed. They're paying for your sin. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what it teaches. So God said, someone has to pay for all our sins, every one of our sins. Someone's got to pay for it. Who's going to do it? Anybody? Volunteers? No, we don't want to. We know we deserve to pay for it, but we don't want to. So he said, my son will do it. So God came in the flesh, and he died on the cross. All of our sins were laid upon him, and God poured his wrath upon his son and paid for sin once and for all. So sin has been paid for. So even though we still sin today, it's already been paid for. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. Our sins have been paid for completely. And so all we need to do now is believe in the work of Jesus Christ. That his work on the cross was enough to pay for my sins. And that God now will receive me as a child of God because of his son Jesus Christ who made me righteous. What does that cause you to do? Appreciate God for what he's done for you. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Where you're so appreciative that you go, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do it because I deserve death and yet you saved me. So if you want me to clean toilets, I'll clean toilets, Lord. If you want me just to serve in this area, I'll serve in this area, Lord, whatever it is, because you saved my soul from the pit of hell. And the Holy Spirit takes that, makes it real, and begins to move in your life. Lord, I want to be a better husband. Lord, I want to be a better wife. Lord, I want to be a better Christian woman, a Christian man, Lord. I want to be a godly person, Lord. Help me with all these areas, Lord, because you died for me. So help me, Lord. That's what the Lord wants in our lives. If you don't know the Lord and you're struggling on whether you do or not, I'm going to give you this opportunity again. And it's fine as long as it's from the heart. God sees it. He sees it. He hears all things. He knows what's in your heart. So let's bow our heads. Father, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, and through your spirit, if you're willing, and if those that are willing, Lord, to fully humble themselves before you and say, Lord, I need you. I need your spirit in my life. Would you be my God and my Savior? And would you work in me, Lord? There's so much work to do. Father, I know I'm not done yet. There's more to do, Lord. And so I'm humbling myself before you now and asking you to come into my life and be my God and my King and work out my salvation. For you are the author and finisher of my faith, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.